Welcome to Bible Study for Progressives, a show where moderates, liberals, and leftists of all faiths and ideologies come together to discuss scripture, spirituality, and politics. We engage scripture in its historical context, plumb its depths for wisdom and guidance, and apply its lessons to current events and social issues. Whether you're a liberal evangelical, a New Age spiritualist, a social justice activist, or a postmodern theologian, there's something in this show for you. Come, be energized in spirit and mind to understand the word and what it means to be a spiritual person in today's world. Today's show is, I Pledge Allegiance to Jesus, Responding in Faith to the Promise of Salvation. We will read from Romans chapter 10 verses 5 to 10, and then we will examine what it means to believe. I have with me today Professor David Westfall. My name is Rich Procida, and I write biblical commentary at modernlectionaries.blogspot.com. Let's begin. Moses writes, concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified. And one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I pledge allegiance to Jesus, responding in faith to the promise of salvation. By Rich Procida. Paul is making a universal claim. Do not say who is to go to hell or to heaven. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone who confesses that Jesus is Lord 
and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead shall be saved. For Paul, to say Jesus is Lord is much more than a statement of belief. It's a pledge of allegiance. The Roman Emperor Caesar was called Lord, the Son of God. In the ancient world, kings and emperors were considered divine. To call Jesus Lord is to pledge allegiance to Christ and not to the empire. The word salvation, as used in the Bible, most often refers to liberation from oppression and release from captivity. Ultimately, it is freedom from death and the threat of death at the hands of the authorities. For Paul, Christianity is a movement for the salvation of all of humanity, not just the Jews. Nowhere in Romans does Paul say that only those who think like he does will be saved. Instead, Paul writes that we should not quarrel over opinions. Our faith before God is our own individual conviction. Paul is arguing for the inclusion of the Gentiles, despite the fact that they are uncircumcised and do not follow the law. He describes them as strong in faith because they no longer need the law. Paul calls himself an apostle to the Gentiles. And he says that Christ is the end of the law so that righteousness can be imputed to anyone who believes. Righteousness, or acting justly, cannot be obtained through the law. The law demands only adherence, but not faith. Without faith in God's justice, without believing God vindicated Jesus. The law is without purpose or meaning. It demands neither truth nor justice. The political and religious authorities' execution of Jesus brings into focus the meaning of the resurrection. The empire killed an innocent, blameless, and nonviolent man. So God raised him, metaphorically, from the dead in the form of the Jesus movement. The execution of Jesus did not stop his ministry. Instead, Jesus became a symbol for oppressed and martyred people everywhere. In a mere 300 years, Jesus would become the God of the very empire that executed him. Listen to what Paul says. The word is in our hearts and on our lips. The temple, the church and its doctrines are not where God resides. Instead, God is in our hearts and on our lips. God speaks through us when we speak truth to power and when we live the life to which we are called. We are called to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, and freedom to the oppressed. We do this because we believe that history vindicates the martyrs by raising up movements that changed the world. The moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. In believing this, we believe in the resurrection. No matter what the powers do to us, 
They may even kill us. They can't stop humanity's relentless march toward freedom. Our declaration that Jesus is Lord is to speak truth to power. It brings salvation to the world and is the beginning of God's kingdom on earth. It is a metaphor for a just and peaceful world. Christianity is a mass movement. Paul felt compelled to bring the message of Christ to the Gentiles. Once they hear that though put to death by the empire, Jesus lives, that his message carries on through us and his spirit still moves us, they will stand up and believe. To believe, as used in the Bible, means to devote oneself to. The word translated as believe is pissed, meaning to faith. It's a verb, an action. The resurrection symbolizes the overthrow of the powers, both spiritual and political. Believing that Jesus is Lord upended the imperial dogma of peace through domination. The world can be changed through nonviolent resistance, speaking, believing, and acting in faith. This is the path to salvation, to march through the city gates, to the center of power, to confront the authorities, the powers and principalities that rule this world. It is to declare that Jesus and not the emperor, or wealth, or status, or power, but Jesus, the innocent one, the downtrodden, the poor, the oppressed, the one hung on a tree. This Jesus, the representative of all humanity, is Lord. We worship the risen Christ and not the empire. Christ is risen. Jesus is Lord. How beautiful the feet of those who who bring good news. Now let's turn to our discussion. Welcome, Professor Westfall. Hi, Rich. Thank you for being here again. So, is Paul's message here universal or exclusive? I mean, what does Paul mean when he says that if we confess with our lips and believe in our hearts, we will be saved? And how does this correspond with Paul's instruction that we are not to quarrel over our differences and instead let faith be a matter of our own personal convictions. Uh, The first part of the question is, is Paul's message here universal or exclusive? And I'd say uh, both, okay? It is universal in the sense that it's available to all, but exclusive in the sense that not everyone will willingly receive it. Paul talks about confessing with our lips and believing in our hearts, and uh, this is uh, pretty much the program here, or the pattern for those who hear the gospel, okay? And I'll go into more detail on the next question about that very important issue. Uh, The other thing here was the idea here about quarreling over differences, and And that specific passage there in Romans, uh, I believe it was chapter 13, actually it's Romans 14, Paul was talking about some kind of secondary issues, okay? And some people believed that they could only eat vegetables, and other people thought it was okay to eat meat and so forth. And Paul was very fine with that. If you feel like you should do this, you should do this. And if you feel like you don't have to do that, you don't have to do that, and uh, 
he wanted people not to look down on other people who's uh, even though they were believers in Jesus, they might have different opinions on some of these other uh, secondary issues. And uh, for as far as Paul was concerned, he didn't want people to go out and he didn't want some kind of caste system where some people thought that they were better than others. He didn't want some kind of elitism where some people thought that they were more knowledgeable than others and looked down on people who had a little bit different understandings than they did. Yeah. And you see this in Christendom right now. Uh, you see different churches and different denominations, and they have different practices. I've been involved for some years uh, in a church that practices feet washing, as Jesus did in John chapter 13. And some of the people, honestly, in this per- these denominations kind of feel like it's like, gee, everybody ought to do this. And I think I think it's a nice ritual. I think that there's you know the humility aspects of it is a very fine thing. On the other hand, uh, I don't think it's something that people should have a whole lot of problems with other people who don't do that. Yeah, I uh, really disagree with that because these issues were not minor issues; these were major issues. So it's easy for us. Um, 2,000 years later to say, well, it was just uh, what food do you eat? Or it was just, because it was ultimately, who do you have share the table with? A lot yeah, of- yeah I, I can see your point there. Um, this could be uh, something here that would cause people not to be fellowshipping with others. And, and eating with people is, a, you know, really it's very, very central in uh, fellowship. And I said, somebody once said, I saw a quotation They said that the Bible is one of the eatingest books in the world. And there's an awful lot of situations where people are sharing food together. And uh, so, you know, I don't want to downplay uh, this is uh, at, at that time, we, you know, we kind of think we have a tendency to kind of go out there and project our own era into people 2,000 years ago, and uh, which is probably not a good idea. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, and I, I'm, it sounds like kind of I may have been guilty of that in this particular situation. Yeah. It, Paul was writing to people who he wasn't sure whether they supported him or not. He was trying to get support for his ministry, but he suspected that they had heard things about him or had opinions about it that he needed to address in the letter. Of course, in the background of the letter is the fact that he never makes it to Rome to, Rome to visit these um, people. He may have been writing it, some say, in preparation for the trial or court or a council the, in Jerusalem that he was going to, where he was essentially being brought up on charges before the church of, I guess, preaching... I don't know. It's not what it would be called. It would be heresy. Heresy. That's basically what people were saying, because mm-hmm. he was had a different take on a lot of things than the Judaism in which he was raised up. Yeah. So, and then he gets arrested there and ends up being executed, never makes it to Rome. So this is all, I think, an important part of the the what's going on here to get the context of, of what's happening, the the perceived threat that Paul was both to the, well, basically Peter and James and those who felt that you had to be circumcised and and follow the law, and the Romans who obviously perceived him as a threat as well for preaching a doctrine that says don't worship the emperor and don't worship the city gods. So when we when we're going in there, there's another article I wrote called "This Flap Over Food is About More Than We Think," and so this conflict is is a is a central conflict between Paul and the and the church. Also, I really wonder. This is Paul's last letter, and so I'm wondering if we should look at it as perhaps at some of his maturity as a Christian, that he's coming in and talking to people which he feels, believe, that you need to be circumcised and follow the law and may not support his ministry to the Gentiles. 
and also perhaps parent preparing his argument for the council. Now, again, this is something that people can differ on a little bit because in Romans 14, verse 17, Paul says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So it's not that eating and drinking are not important, just I think he's pointing out here that some things are even more important. Right. And then when we go to the very beginning of the reading, we see him saying something like, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord is going to be saved. And nowadays, pluralism is a, practically a moral imperative for most of for the world. We need to learn how to live with other faiths and respect other faiths and live with people who are different than us. So I think this is a more important issue than just something where we can say, uh, some Christians, it's a it's an internal Christian squabble about relatively unimportant things. That's not true. I mean, it's very important today. Are we going to accept pluralism and pluralistic views? Are we going to incorporate them um, into our faith? What is Paul saying here? Because he goes back and he says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's It seems to allude to to a more openness. Don't quarrel over opinions. Now, obviously, there are people who aren't going to to get it. It's not so much about a matter of whether they become a Christian or not. It's just whether they're going to get that we need to lift up the poor, whether they're going to get that we have to do some work to make the world a better place. Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, this is, you know, uh, Jesus wanted us to work for the advancement of his kingdom here on earth. Okay. And it's just not like, well, okay, we call upon the name of the Lord and we believe in him and immediately we're out of here. Now we're still very much here. In a sense, we're more here now because we're under better direction. Let, let me ask you this. How does believing bring about salvation and what does it mean to believe i mean can paul's message be seen today as open and affirming meaning oh that's usually a term used for um accepting gays and lesbians um or universalist meaning that it affirms other faiths and this is sort of a minimalist interpretation which People need only believe to, and they don't need to become with Jews, they don't need to be circumcised, they don't need to follow a law. So, I mean, I think I explained the believing in the article, but how do you see it? How does believing bring about salvation, and what does it mean to to believe in this message? I think we've got actually two issues, so uh, let me just address them. Uh, first is the issue about believing. Okay, and the word believing is also translated as trust or relying on somebody. And uh, I've seen many different illustrations. One I particularly like is uh, the guy, uh, he's got a tightrope wire going across Niagara Falls, and uh, he's got a wheelbarrow, and he puts a 200 pound sack of potatoes in the wheelbarrow, and he goes out and wheels it across the to over this Niagara Falls, you know, way up in the air and everything like that. And if he falls off, he's dead, and the potatoes go down with him. And he wheels it across, and then he comes back, and then he asks the person sitting on the bank, do you think I could wheel you across like this safely? And the guy says, yeah, I wear less than that sack of potatoes, so that shouldn't be a problem. And then the guy says, uh, okay, get in the wheelbarrow. Okay, at that point, you see the belief here is transformed from a kind of a belief in uh, some kind of abstract fact into something uh, very concrete. Uh, Am I going to trust my life to this guy or not? Okay, and that's kind of the way I see belief. Okay, Uh, the Bible shows us as uh, human beings as flawed, faulty, having a big problem. And this problem is our separation from God by our sins. And Christ came to go out and take care of that problem. And there's 
multiple different theories on the atonement, and some people think one is better than the other, and some people uh, think another is better. Uh, I think all of them have some kind of merit, but it's basically here in a variety of different ways, uh, whether paying for our sins or being obedient in a way that we couldn't be obedient or recapturing the world from Satan, uh, on and on, uh, Jesus did it, okay? And uh, so that's, that's kind of this first step. Now, when you bring in the pluralism issue, now you're getting into kind of a gray area that actually the scriptures doesn't address that much. On the other hand, there are some hints in there, I think, that uh, people can, uh, uh, can, can, can latch on to. I think the ideal is that everyone will get a chance to hear a Jesus, but in practice, not everyone does get or did get that opportunity. Another way of saying this, I think, is that Jesus is kind of God's plan A, okay? Now, unfortunately, there are people out there that are never going to hear a Jesus. If you look at Hebrews 11, there's a chapter there, uh, and sometimes people call it the Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame chapter, because it's about people in the Old Testament who showed great faith and are recognized as heroes of the faith. Now, really get down to it, none of these people ever knew anything about Jesus, okay? I may have had some kind of vague ideas about a Messiah that was going to come, but they really didn't know about Jesus, but they trusted in God, and uh, they were saved by their faith. Uh, they recommended as people for us to follow, us, people who have heard of Jesus. So I, I think we get some hints about the plan B uh, for those who never hear about Jesus in the first two chapters of Romans. Uh, Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Okay, and the very end, last couple words there. Now to say that people are without excuse strongly implies that they can respond appropriately to the revelation that they have received just by seeing the natural creation. I'm convinced that was the basis of salvation for those mentioned in Hebrews 11 who really never heard of Jesus. And I think that grace extends to others who never have the opportunity to hear about Jesus. The scriptures present plan A in multiple overlapping ways, and that's great for those of us who do have a Bible. And for people that have the Bible, and we have this plan here laid out here in many different ways, uh, we don't need plan B because uh, we've got all the information we need here to follow through on plan A. In Romans 2.14 it says, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witnesses in their thoughts, sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. That passage shows a revelation for God that is also available to all who never get exposed to the gospel. So, you know, God just doesn't abandon the rest of the world out here. Well, you never heard of Jesus, tough luck, okay? Uh, you, you get these little hints there that, yeah, he is concerned about these people, and these people can respond appropriately. Now, what the Bible doesn't really say is what responding appropriately is for them, but again, we're reading this in the scriptures, which means we do got the, the, the plan A. I, I think we need to f read Romans, the entire book, in the context of its purpose, of, that, of its universal or inclusive purpose, that Paul is arguing that Gentiles be included. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think today we don't have... Like we don't have the issue about food, we don't have the issue with quote unquote Gentiles, but I think we need to look and include everyone and that these passages go beyond simply um, to people who don't know about Jesus, to people who do, but maybe grew up in different faiths, or people who are spiritual in, in different ways. What is the connection between 
our faith in action. Is salvation here only about the afterlife, or is it, as I said, about liberation from oppression and release from captivity? How are we to respond to the promise of salvation? Okay, this has been, you know, kind of a long-standing issue in the church for a long, long time. And everybody's, I think a lot of people are familiar with Martin Luther, and he was very much, uh, you know, on the aid idea. It was only faith, uh, sola fide in Latin. So that kind of leads to an idea in some quarters, I think, that, oh, gee, uh, I'll just pray a prayer. Or I'll kind of, you know, pledge allegiance to Jesus or something like that. And after that, everything is all okay, and I don't have to do anything else. Nothing else is expected of me. Nothing else is required of me. And uh, I think that's really a great misunderstanding. I think you can put it this way. Good works are the result of salvation, not its cause. Okay. Uh, People often quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but they kind of omit verse 10, but uh, the three verses together read, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For, and then here's the part that the law kind of gets skipped over sometimes. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do, okay? So basically the idea of salvation is not, uh, this is not the end of the line. Uh, This is the start of the trip, okay? Mm -hmm. From there, the idea is that we have been changed, we've been transformed, we've been empowered in a way that we haven't, we're not empowered before. And so then uh, we're supposed to use this, these gifts that we have received to go out there and help further the kingdom of God, okay? And this uh, and it definitely includes making things better for people just on a secular basis, okay? Uh, somebody comes up with a cure for cancer, okay? And I hope it's soon because I, I uh, have some dear friends that are struggling with it. But uh, that work in itself is really part of the work of the kingdom of God, okay? I uh, do social security disability work, and cancer is is a lot of cancers are are treatable now, and they are people are surviving more, so uh, they're they're beating it uh, little by little. I I had colon cancer back in 1987. Oh, that's a tough one. So I yeah, I took out half the upper half of my colon, and. Uh, uh, I got here uh, 28 years out of that, 29 years out of that. That's, that's a pretty yeah. good deal. Yeah, that's great. So I've been getting good mileage on that. Yes. <laughs> so we have been equipped, and I think it's not only because we have are transformed by the renewing of our minds, but also that we've been given a coded text, more or less, but a, a text, a a, a book and a, a tradition that calls upon us and gives us the clues about how to go about transforming the world, how to go about uh, creating God's kingdom here on earth. Now, what is the connection between social justice, politics, spirituality, and religion? Are spiritual and religious people called to seek peace and justice i mean can we truly be spiritual without having compassion for the suffering of others around the world can we be faithful yet do nothing to address injustice in the world i think jesus was the very embodiment of compassions for others i don't see how anyone could claim to be a follower of jesus and not be following him in that way also of course this wasn't something that just came up when jesus came around the old testament prophets were also very concerned about these issues Uh, we have the very well known passage amos 6 8 he has shown you O mortal what is good and what does your the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. 
And I did an online search at BibleGateway.com, and I found 249 verses that included the word peace. And this is in the NIV version, but it would be pretty much the same in most other translations. 156 in the Old Testament and 93 in the New Testament. So this is an issue that gets a lot of, a lot of press in, in the scriptures. And so does salvation, and so does justice. Yeah. A salvation is not just in the New Testament, you know, it, it's yeah. throughout the Old Testament. Same thing, basically. Yeah. You know, I, I like that website. You just go out there and say, okay, do a search on this word. And it goes out and it lays out all the verses here that have that word in it, and it goes out and bold faces the word. See? So you just got read down here, you know, and it's like, well, 249. You know, it normally it gives you 25 results. I say, I'll move it up to 500 results, and I get it all on one screen. Yeah, that's it. And you can pull out your concordance to look them up as well. Yeah, well, that's what I used to use until I found this stuff online. <laughs> you know, but this is way better than a concordance. How are um, religion and politics intertwined? Given the influence religion has on our values and beliefs, can politics and religion ever be separated, and if so, should they be? I mean, in the first century, politics and religion were the same thing. Kings and emperors were sons of God, and the religious laws were the law of the land. So how are religion and politics similar, and how are they different? Well, religion and politics are ultimately concerned with values, defining what is right and what is not right, uh, seeking more good and less evil. I think we can all agree here that people that prey on elderly people should be stopped. Okay, I think that elderly people should be protected from people <coughs> who would be trying to exploit them. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in both religion and politics, especially I'd say it's unfortunate you see this in religion, there can be a tendency toward the concept that the end justifies the means. And uh, I think that religious people especially should resist that temptation, okay? Uh, it's not just enough to achieve what you consider to be the right results if you're using unethical, immoral methods, uh, then that's uh, kind of like, a, let's say, a hollow victory, okay? We need to do the right thing. We need to try to get the right things done, but we need to do that in the right way. And uh, I think, and, I, and I've had personal experiences in churches where people were using the wrong methods to uh, supposedly re achieve the right ends. And uh, that was uh, I, uh, two churches I used to be a member of, mm. which I am no longer a member of. <laughs> okay. There's more on this, people with strong religious beliefs, they're free to vote for people and policies that match their religious ideals. Uh, the, the reality of the situation is we're all not going to ever totally agree on a lot of things. Okay? Now, I personally am kind of a you know, person that has the idea that sometimes a dialectical situation where one person is pushing for one thing and another person is trying to achieve uh, worthwhile goals coming at it from a different direction that people interacting, that you may get a better result than if just it's all one way and nobody thinks about some of these other issues. So it's, it's not like the, the unity we can have is loving each other. We may not in this life have unity on some of the other issues. Okay, We can agree to disagree. There are a lot of different denominations. You can break them down into kind of families, but you know you can probably... Even so, you probably got at least 10 different groups that have some different views on this and that and the other thing, whether it's uh, liturgy or other issues or politics or whatever. Uh, we don't have to agree, but we got to love each other. I often say religion and politics are two sides of the same coin. They Religion was essentially politics, and a lot of when we're talking about like the Pharisees, they're often considered kind of a political party, so religion and politics were were essentially the same thing. And when we say Jesus is Lord, for instance, we're we're really saying that there's a higher authority that right. we're putting human beings and and peace and justice, uh, care for the poor, 
released to the captive. All these values we're supposed to be lifting up. And I, I really believe that if we if we changed our priorities and put the last first, as Jesus says, our priorities as a people are to care for the least of these, to take care of the sick, the elderly, the infirm, the disabled, even even drug addicts and, and the lazy. Even. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody needs Jesus. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, we're talking about religion and politics. Jesus said repeatedly, many, many different times, he talked about his kingdom. Well, that certainly has some uh, political implications. It really does. And we're supposed to be, you know, this is your title, your deal here. I pledge allegiance to Jesus. I mean, that's the concept. What's going on here in this world is important, but we're supposed to be following Jesus to the best of our ability to the light that we have and we may all be doing the same things and honestly i'd be scared if everybody was going the same way because if everybody's going the same way maybe we're all going the wrong direction yeah so that i think so, you know one of the things disagreements among people is one of the things that help people correct course when things start going the wrong way yeah yeah i often find it scary too i mean it's just it that doesn't strike me as honest to go in and say we all believe the same thing, we all think the same way. And, and Paul specifically saying, let's not quarrel over opinions. Let's not argue about whether we think you should be circumcised or not circumcised. Today it might be, let's not quarrel about whether you have to think that people have to be Christian to go to heaven or that you have to believe certain doctrines to be to be a true Christian. I mean, even near the end of Romans, he talks about not getting caught up in these strange doctrines. And, and I think that's just a, an indication of don't get so caught up in thinking that you're right. You know. And then he says not to listen to people who cause dissensions and offenses in opposition to this teaching, which is a real inclusive teaching. Yeah, you know, in Romans 15, 1 here, it's kind of continuing this whole thing that he started up with on the food issue in 14. But he said, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. If you're stronger than somebody else, that's not something to be proud of. That just means you've got more of an obligation to help somebody who people are weak on. And, and what he's talking about here, he's describing that the people who no longer need the law, the Gentiles, are st strong in faith. And the people who require the law, he refers to them as, as weak in faith. And he says in um, chapter 14, do we not live to ourselves and do we not die to ourselves? If we live, we live to the Lord and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For this is the end Christ died for and lived again so that we might be Lord of both the dead and the living. So he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. So what he's saying here is whatever you do, if you do it to the Lord, if you do it for justice, if you do it for, for, for peace, if you do it for out of compassion, if you do it out of love, and all these things are, God is like a metaphor for, for all that is good. Give us the room to, to have different points of views and different opinions and not require us to be caught up in one rigid way of thinking and i think he's doing this while he's on the way to jerusalem to face this council where he's being accused and he, he's saying we don't need all the dissensions let's just allow each other to disagree one of the things is that the evangelicals that justice has become something that is de-emphasized to the nth degree that I was speaking with someone yesterday, justice is received only in terms of God exacting punishment. But justice is 
so huge in the Bible, and yet sometimes in some Christian circles, it takes almost no role. And so we see that people who are saying we're following the Bible, we're doing it literally, we're we're Bible believing, and our world is a biblical world, not really, because they're not they're only reading their theology into the Bible, and they're not really seeing the major themes justice peace the poor i mean my god and then we get they go into the polling places and it's we're gonna kill people we we're gonna win and it becomes like a blood sport and this is not this is the opposite of what jesus asked for and wanted now people though Even liberals often confuse, especially liberals, they confuse the separation of church and state with the separation of religion and politics. The First Amendment begins, Congress shall pass no law. And what this means is that only the state is prohibited. Churches are free to do whatever they want. And many churches are deeply involved in social issues. In fact, the First Amendment isn't designed to restrict the speech or religious freedoms of individuals. The only thing that prevents churches from endorsing political candidates is the tax code. Why do we have the separation of church and state, and how does it protect religious and political freedom? What are your views on the separation of church and state? I'm a great believer in the separation of church and state. However, as you pointed out, Different people interpret that concept different ways. Uh, The First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, okay? And what they're talking about there is what they had in England, which you see, uh, I think still to this day, in Germany, uh, other countries where a certain denomination is kind of accepted as the state religion. And the government may actually be going out and paying part of the salaries of the ministers. And that was something that the people that wrote the Constitution saw it was creating problems in other countries. So they says, okay, we're not going to have an official religion here, which is kind of considered more important than some other religion. We're just not going to do that. The individual states actually could do that if they wanted to. And for a while, Maryland was actually the official church of the state of Maryland, Uh, was the Catholic Church. Well, that's gone by now, and so we don't really have any official religions in any state or in this country. The other part of the First Amendment here is that it says that Congress shall make no laws respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Okay, that's the other side of the coin. The government can't say this is our official religion here in this country, And they also can't say, hey, you can't practice your religion according to your own ideas. Obviously, there has to be some limitations on that. If somebody said, my religion involves human sacrifice, well, that's not what this is talking about. It's just common sense. You're not doing anything that's uh, particularly going to create big problems for a lot of people. Uh, Do what you want. Uh, This has been upheld in various ways. Uh, Some of the uh, indigenous peoples, uh, there is a religion in some of the indigenous peoples where they take peyote, okay, which might be otherwise, you know, restricted by law uh, because it's part of the religion. It doesn't seem to be causing big problems. The Supreme Court upheld the right to do this. Uh, There is definitely some latitude here for individuals, whatever their religious beliefs are or lack thereof, uh, they are free to go out and operate on the basis of their beliefs. Okay, So you, one person might say, my religious beliefs, I think that there should be, say, parental notification of an underage girl who wants to have an abortion. Okay, And somebody else might have kind of feel the same way, even though it wasn't based on a religious premise. Uh, either way, people can go out and follow their beliefs and as a guidance they think that they have. Just that somebody were to come into Congress or something like that, they couldn't go out and write a law that says everybody has to be a member of this my church. We're free to go out and use whatever guidance we have. And maybe it's ethical, maybe it's based on religion, uh, maybe it's based on sometimes it does, no getting around it. People based 
make decisions based on personal interest. Okay, um, that's fine. There's all kinds of motives out there, and religion as a motive isn't kind of like second class. Okay, mm-hmm. we're all kind of on the level playing field here. Um, there are actually three views on the separation of church and state. There's the narrow view um, that that you've expressed, where the state simply cannot create a church, enforce the church, or require people to attend services, or require them to be a particular religion. Right, yeah. It's for support of the state church. Yeah, for the support of the state church. But there's the, there's also, most people are aware of the strict separation, this type of, where religion should play no part in any government function. And then there's the sort of accommodation this or using the endorsement test. And that's sort of where I fall in the middle way, where it's okay to, for example, to have a Christmas display on City Hall as long as you have a, a equals displays of other give faiths. other people the opportunity to put their religious displays. Right. No problem. Right. So, because uh, we are a diverse country, and we don't want to go out and favor one group over another. Yeah. And I think we really need more discussion. I don't think the First Amendment was designed to restrict free expression mm-hmm. in a sense that what we need is more discussion about religion, not less. And there's... Uh, a lot of movement on the left to try and suppress discussion of religion as if religion is an inappropriate topic, topic for discussion, for discussion yeah. in, in, if you're discussing politics or if you're the, for the government, but it, it's not. We need to promote more discussion of religious literacy and education and sharing. And I think that's what pluralism is about. Now, I'm not sure on the peyote case that the court approved that. My recollection is that the court actually, are, are you citing a particular case on the peyote? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. So I may need actually, to do there was a case. On this, but, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't this, but I mean, there have right. been rulings in certain cases where there have been exemptions. I mean, maybe right. it's as simple as somebody going out and, okay, example, somebody's having a Bible study in their home. And then somebody is trying to use the zoning ordinances to keep them from having a Bible study in their home. I mean, and it's like not people are out there making a lot of noise and disturbing anybody. Somebody just doesn't want a lot of cars coming in the neighborhood. Well, at a certain point, you say, let's chill out a little bit, okay? Let's, let's relax. Let's not all get all wound up about things that may not be that important. Yeah, I think the point is made, in, and really the court in that case should have ruled a different way, but they wanted to apply the policies of the drug law, and they sort of said the policies of the drug law outweigh these persons' religious freedom. Right, right, that, and that's and that's and that's a pretty marginal case there because you know no question about it, the improper use of drugs is a big problem in our society. That's really one of these edgy issues that uh, could have gone either way. And so it's probably not a good example. Yeah. And one thing I, I have to say to liberals and leftists is that they need to remember that religion is the reason we lose elections. Right now we have a hu- huge swath of evangelicals who have turned the tide of the election in Iowa and put crews on the top of the heat, perhaps because... They realize that Trump is not a Christian, in a sense. Right. And when you talk on political talk shows, they say, oh, I don't want to hear about religion because they're so used to being proselytized at. Or they just have a negativity towards religion. And they blame it for our world's problems. But as Reza Aslan pointed out, we don't need God to kill each other. We just do it. And political ideologies can have the same effect. Communism, Marxism other ideologies have supported violence so we really need to be talking about religion 
just as much as we need to be talking about politics because po- religion is politics when yeah, it comes right one of down these to it. Here, you can't just ignore it, the issue and pretend it isn't there because that's not being realistic. You know? And I thought, you know, bringing in here communism, Nazism, so forth, and religious excesses at various times in history and various places. One of the big problems here is the combination here of strong ideologies with power. Um, the ideology can be secular or religious, but you get this combination of a strong ide- ideology with political power, uh, the results, the track record is not good. And that's one of the things here about the whole idea of separation of church and state. The point there was uh, break that up, okay, so that we don't have religion, which is, when you get down to it, a strong ideology controlling the government. If you look at the history of the Roman Empire, okay, is it First, it came up to before Constantine, uh, around 300 and something A.D. In that time period, decided that you know this is we're all going to go Christian. Okay, the various emperors at different times favored different religions and so forth, and there was kind of there was actually kind of a plurality, but Christianity was never in the dominant position. And honestly, after Christianity came into power, there were excesses because of that power. So. My own feeling here, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Put it this way, I've seen people in churches, and it's like, God help us if people like that ever get into power in government. (laughs) Not a few, not a lot, but I've seen a few. (laughs) This has been Bible Study for Progressives. If you enjoyed the program, please subscribe to our podcast or put us in your favorites and write a five-star review. Tell your friends about us and share us on social media. Follow us on Facebook and click the donate button at modernlectionaries.blogspot.com. Your support will help us reach more people, produce more and better shows, and cover the cost of production. Feel free to send me a note or comment on the show. I would love to hear from you. Until next time, this is Rich Proceda. Thank you for listening.